The text this morning is from Proverbs chapter 9, starting at verse 1. These are the words of God. Wisdom hath builded her house, she hath hewn out her seven pillars. She hath killed her beasts, she hath mingled her wine, she hath also furnished her table. She hath sent forth her maidens, she crieth upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Jumping down to verse 13. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. For she sitteth at the door of her house, on a seat in the high places of the city, to call passengers who go right on their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. You gave us that word because you wanted us to have it. We pray that you would glorify your name now and make the giving of your word useful to us by giving us your spirit to teach and admonish. We ask for this kindness in the name of Jesus, and amen. Amen. Well, we are continuing with the theme or with the practice of treating a book of the Bible a week, and we've come now to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is actually a collection of books. We'll look at that more in a moment. But this one collection of books, this book of Proverbs, contains more teaching about women than any other book of Scripture. This is a book about women. The structure of the book means that it is all about women, and many of the individual Proverbs, which seem unrelated, are not actually unrelated at all. In other words, you wouldn't be surprised if the book of Proverbs had been given in the 21st century to have admonitions in it to rotate your tires and to change your oil every 3,000 miles. It's that kind of book. It's a very practical, earthy book. And in this, it's all related to wisdom and folly. And wisdom and folly are presented to us as two women, as in our text. uh, Woman is the glory of man the capstone of man. She is the best. Woman ruined is hellbait. She is the worst. Woman is the crown of man, and that means as the crown, she's the best, and a crown fallen is a crown fallen from a great place. She is the worst. Woman is the best. Woman is the worst. And this is set out for us in multiple ways all the way through the book of Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs, two different kinds of women are giving invitations to come and taste, come and eat. So both, if you look at, compare what Lady Wisdom says in the first part of chapter 9, and you look at what Folly says, they, what they say on the surface in terms of uh, their words are very similar. Come, come, I've prepared a banquet. Come, I've prepared something for you. I have something ready for you. I've got something for you. Lady Wisdom says this, but she is a noble lady presiding over a great table in a great banqueting hall. The other is Dame Folly, blouse unbuttoned, enticing the simpletons. And as the book of Proverbs um, reveals, she's operating in a target-rich environment. There, There are many simpletons. There are many fools. The drastic difference in the nature of these invitations sets up a conflict that is pervasive through the whole book of Proverbs. The conflict between wisdom and folly as they relate to every imaginable detail of life. These two women are everywhere. These two women are related to everything. And the first nine chapters of Proverbs sets this up as it's either wisdom or folly. You're either going to be invited to the banquet that wisdom is, has prepared, or you're going to be invited to the hellish banquet that looks good at first, but it turns into a hellish banquet by the end. These two women connect to everything in the book of Proverbs. And it's not surprising, of course, that Proverbs 31 concludes with an ide- ideal portrait of an ideal godly woman. And then everything through the whole book relates to these, uh, these two women. This is why another theme of Proverbs is the theme of contrasting paths or ways, all right? Contrasting paths. If if you listen to wisdom's invitation, you follow the way or the path to her banqueting hall. If you you listen to folly's invitation, you follow the path that leads to destruction. These are two paths with radically different destinations. The terms of value and praise 
in Proverbs are frequently related to jewelry, garlands, crowns, silver and gold, the woman's touch. Women glorify things, either truly or falsely, but they are the glory of man. Paul tells us that in Corinthians. The woman is the glory of man, and they glorify either, if they're a true woman, they glorify truly. If they are a false woman, they glorify falsely. Men are commended in the book of Proverbs, throughout the book of Proverbs. Men are commended for their industry, and sluggards are condemned for their slack hand, because men were called, in the book of Proverbs, men were called to bring home the old covenant equivalent of bacon, of the bacon. Whatever old covenant men brought home wasn't bacon, but whatever they brought home, <laughs> whatever they brought home, it was supposed to be something. So all the, all the vocational activity and industry in Proverbs, far from being a snapshot of, quote unquote, a man's world, this is not a, a, a snapshot of a man's world, this is a snapshot of a world in which everything is related to what's brought to these women. All right, well, everything is connected to this. So men go out and they gather the wherewithal and they either surrender their substance to the adulteress, they either throw it all away, they set a match to it, burn the whole thing up, or they bring it to wisdom and wisdom takes it and glorifies it. So all this vocational activity is not a snapshot of a man's world. It is an activity designed to bring raw material home to the woman so that she might glorify it or that she might throw it away. All right, so... Uh, a man either brings it to, the, to Dame Folly and she throws it away, or he brings it to Lady Wisdom and she glorifies it wonderfully. I said earlier that, that the book of Proverbs is actually a collection of books, just like the book of Psalms is a collection of five books that, that were, it was edited and put together in its modern um, uh, form some centuries after the composition of some of the Psalms. In the same way, the book of Proverbs is a collection of books. Books of Proverbs. The form of the book as we have it breaks out into the following sections. The first is a set of didactic poems, Proverbs 1, 1 through 9, 18, through the end of chapter 9. Our text is from the conclusion of that book. So a set of didactic poems, and these poems set up strongly the theme of wisdom and folly as two women. The second section is a collection of the Proverbs of Solomon, that's Proverbs 10.1 through 22.16. That's the bulk of the book, the Proverbs of Solomon. This section contains almost 400 Proverbs, around 375, something like that. The third section is Words of the Wise. It's a short section, Proverbs 22.17 through 24.22. The fourth book is a very brief collection of more words from the wise, almost a postscript, uh, Proverbs 24, 23 through verse 34. The fifth section comes back to, the, to Solomon as the author again. It's another small book by Solomon, a collection preserved, it says, by Hezekiah's men, Proverbs 25, 1 through 29, 27. And it's possible that Hezekiah's men, the men who assembled this small book, were also the editors of the book of Proverbs as a whole. The sixth section comes from an unknown man named Augur. That is Proverbs 30, um, uh, 31 through 33. It's followed by another short section by an unknown king, Lemuel, Proverbs 31, 1 through 9. Now it's possible, and this is just an aside, it's possible that both Augur and Lemuel were of Massa. The word for oracle that you see in both those texts, the the oracle is Hamasa, and that might refer to a proper name. That might be a proper name. And if it is a proper name, if you look at the genealogies of Genesis, this would mean that uh, Augur and Lemuel were Ishmaelites. So uh, there was no King Lemuel that we, ha that we know of in the history of Israel. So either that's a known king who had an odd name that we don't know about, uh, or it is uh, a king of another nation. And uh, that is at least a reasonable reconstruction or conjecture. The last section of Proverbs is a poem of praise for a very particular woman, Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. Although she is not named, her aspect is in this section is very concrete, as distinct from the metaphorical and somewhat abstract Lady Wisdom. So Lady Wisdom is doing um, uh, very particular things, but it's a 
uh, it's very clearly a personification. So you have Lady Wisdom and, and Dame Folly both doing their things. But when you get to Proverbs 31, uh, th this woman is a, an incarnation, a particular instance of the kind of wisdom that we're talking about through the whole book. So, all of that said, let's talk for a moment about how Proverbs work. And I think it's probably most important to, to point to how they don't work. How do Proverbs work? Now, Proverbs are aphorisms. They are general truths. They're aphorisms. They are general truths. They are not axioms in geometry. All triangles have three sides, and you will never find ever anywhere a triangle that doesn't have three sides. By definition, a triangle has three sides. Some Christians err. They think they have a high view of the inspiration of Scripture when they go to the book of Proverbs and they treat a proverb as though it's saying this triangle has three sides. It does, the proverbs don't work that way. So all triangles have three sides. You'll never find a triangle that doesn't have three sides. But a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and sometimes your blinkered uncle dies and leaves you with $3 million. Now, now you're, that happens sometimes, right? You may have run into an instance of it. You, you say, I can't believe, you know. I can't believe. Now, why can't you believe it? Why, do you, why, can't, my, why can't this uncle see what he just did? Can't, can't he see what he just did? Now, why are you so astonished? Well, because the proverb is true, and this particular violation of the proverb simply points to the general truth of the proverb. Generally speaking, lazy people come to nothing. Generally speaking, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding the hands to rest, and you don't win the lottery, you don't inherit $3 million from your uncle. Generally speaking, poverty comes on you like an armed man with a club. And he, and he works you over. That's what generally happens. That's what we're generally used to. And that's why we're surprised when something different happens. That does not contradict the truthfulness of the proverb. It just simply points to the fact that it is, in fact, a proverb. Proverbs are true, but they're not tautological truths. They are truths for living in a rough and tumble world where there's a constant need for adjustments, interpretations, generalizations, and troubleshooting as you go. So, a lazy bum sometimes has that stupid uncle. But, the author of Proverbs would say, don't bet on it. Don't bet on it. Don't count on it. That's not the way it usually goes. That's how Proverbs function. They are general truths. They are truth. Uh, think of a proverb as truth in a suitcase, uh, packed for a journey. You're, you're on your way. You're, travel, you're, you're traveling and living out of the suitcase, and you're having to adapt. You're having to adjust as you go. That's how Proverbs function. Proverbs have three general characteristics. The book of Proverbs is a book of poetry, but it's not lyric poetry in our Western sense. It's, it's a book of poetry that depends upon three uh, characteristics. One, you've, we've already noted um, in our discussion of Scripture— one feature of Hebrew poetry is parallelism. The book of Proverbs is full of parallelism, exact parallels, antithetical parallels where you set up a contrast and so forth. But the poetry depends upon thought rhymes or thought anti-rhymes, parallelism. There's a heavy emphasis on imagery, metaphor. And then a third element of Hebrew poetry is this. Hebrew poetry is terse. Hebrew poetry is terse. It, it's stripped down to certain uh, basic truths. As one writer said, think of, think of it as an adage without padage, okay? You, you condense everything and you put it, you, so you, you do that so that it will fit in the suitcase. Here's another way of thinking, another um, biblical scholar points out that when you take a simile, a, a simile and a metaphor work different ways. Simile says this is like that. A metaphor says this is that, all right? This is that, this is like that. When you take a simile and expand it, and work it out into the corners, the simile turns into a parable, all right? An expanded simile is a parable. An expanded metaphor is an allegory. If you take a metaphor and expand it, it becomes an, uh, it becomes an allegory. If you take a simile and expand it, it becomes a parable. Then if you take either the parable or the allegory and condense it down to one statement, 
one, one sentence or one, uh, a couple of sentences together, if you condense, condense it down to that pithy saying, you have a proverb. That's what a proverb is. It's condensed truth taken out of the world, taken out of the rough and tumble world, brought down to a particular instance, and then you are invited to apply it in all wisdom. Now, this is where you might think this... I, I wish that wisdom were not so hard. <laughs> I wish that wisdom were more simple. I could just follow the instructions. I wish that wisdom were a matter of unfolding the instructions, getting a good light, and learning how to insert uh, tab A into slot B. Just follow the instructions, and when you're all done, you've assembled the thing. I wish wisdom were like that. Wisdom in this world is nothing like that. There are isolated areas of life where you have to learn how to be precise in that way. There are places in our life where you have to be precise like that, but there are many areas where you are not supposed to be like that. This is why Proverbs will often lean against one another. If, if you are saying all triangles have three sides and all triangles have four sides, that would be a contradiction. That's not what I'm talking about leaning against each other. Let me, let me illustrate this for you. We need to deal with this, and we need to grow in wisdom. Proverbs 26, 4 and 5 says this. This is the starkest example of it. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. And you're thinking, you're sitting there wanting to be a good Christian, right? Which is it? (laughs) Am I supposed to answer a fool according to his folly, or am I supposed to not answer a fool according to his Which is it? Tell me, tell me, tell me. If you pay back a fool in his coin, you have stepped into his his little economy to help support it. But if you don't pay back a fool that way, then sometimes he won't get paid what he deserves, which would be bad. If you answer a fool according to his folly, if you descend to his level and answer a fool according to his folly, you've become a fool. And... If you don't step into his level and answer him according to his folly, then he does not realize that he is a fool. All right, There there are times when if you do it this way, it goes wrong. And if you do it that way, it goes right. And vice versa. So there are times when you're supposed to answer a fool according to his folly. And there are times when you're not supposed to. Sometimes wisdom does one thing. And this is exasperating for pietists. It's exasperating for legalists. Sometimes wisdom does the opposite. Sometimes wisdom does this, and sometimes wisdom does that. I wish it didn't work that way. Well, tough. That's the way the world is. Let me me, uh, turn it around on you with a couple of proverbs in English. Many hands make light work. Got that? Many hands make light work. Too many cooks spoil the broth. Which is it? Decide. Choose for yourselves to this day whom you will serve. Are you, are you on the too many cooks side or are you on the many hands make life? Well, the answer, of course, is it depends. A wise man looks at a situation and says, this kitchen is already too crowded. We're going to spoil the broth if we get many more hands in here. And someone else says, we're building a barn and we could use an extra 15 people. Right? Wisdom looks at the situation on the ground and understands what you're supposed to do. But you have to keep track of a host of variables, and you have to be steeped in Scripture and steeped in the scriptural thought forms to know which way to go. Otherwise, you're just going to be um, woodenly sticking the wrong proverb onto the wrong situation. Proverbs have all the concrete particularity of legalistic rules, but none of the rigidity. Legalistic rules are rigid. Legalistic rules are rigid. They cannot move. And this is, you'll, you'll periodically see some story about uh, 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 some public school has a, we have a zero tolerance policy on guns at school, right? Zero. And so some little kid has a, a belt buckle with a picture of you know, a gun on it and he gets suspended for three days and, it, and there's an uproar. Well, zero tolerance means zero tolerance. No, zero tolerance means stupidity. That's not how the world is. If you can't adjust on the fly to to real-world situations, then you are not wise. You're a biblical fool. So Proverbs have concrete application. Proverbs apply to the concrete world, but they do it without rigidity. They have all the flexibility of license, but with none of the stupidity and sin, with none of the self-absorption, with none of the self 
centeredness. They have the flexibility that you need, and they have the absolute commitment to the unchanging nature of God. If you take the book of Proverbs as a guidebook for practical Christianity, the way it was given, then you will have wisdom that can deal with obvious problems without resorting to a clunky rule. For example, take entertainment standards. Take your, enterta- take your entertainment standards. Leonard Ravenhill, a Christian writer, once said that entertainment is the devil's substitute for joy. And there are many people who are devoted to this devil's substitute for joy. And if you want to question what they're doing, uh, that's, that's kind of the, that set of movies you just watched, that was kind of a skis fest, right? That was a skis, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing? What they want is a rigid rule, right? No, where does the Bible say thou shalt not watch hard R movies? Well, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't tell us to look to a Hollywood rating system that pagans devised. That's, that's not our standard. Our standard is the Word of God. And, our, and the Word of God is not a set of clunkety-clunkety rules. The Word of God is absolute and clear and pointed and particular. And we can look at a situation, provided we want to be wise, we can look at a situation and, and see at a glance that that is not wise. That is foolish. And if you're demanding, I'm, I'm refused to give this up until you can give me a clunkety clunkety rule quoted from Scripture that tells me that I can't do this. Well, then what you're doing is you're ignoring how the book of Proverbs was given to us. Deal with what you watch with the eye of proverbial wisdom and not a wall of rigid restrictions. Now, let me say one other thing that is important uh, at this point. The book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs is, uh, I, I want to say, speak for a moment to those of you who are in junior high and high school, because that's the target audience of this book. All right? The book of Proverbs is written to a young man, and everything that it says to young men to watch out for, the young women can take heed to by saying, okay, is, is this young man in Proverbs being urged to watch out for girls like me? Right? So whatever he's being told to watch out for, don't be like that. And whatever he's told to seek out, you want to be like that. So there's a, all you have to do is take the instruction of the book of Proverbs and flip it. So it's address, this is addressing a young man. This is addressing an adolescent male. And it's an older, wiser speaker saying, my son, listen to me. My son, do this. My son, watch out for that. My son, here. And then all of the daughters of Israel should say, okay, what's this son being told, cautioned against? What, he, what is he being warned? What kind of guy should I be looking for? And, and so on. So this, this is a book that I want to say is addressed to junior high, high school uh, aged kids. And I'm not excluding, if you, if you want to apply it, if you're in college and you want to apply it, go ahead. If you're not yet in junior high and, and it applies, it fits you like, like a glove, go ahead. That's fine. But the target, the target audience is young people like that. And, and, and you can come to this conclusion if you read through the book of Proverbs thoughtfully. Young people in that age category are either blockheads or are susceptible to blockheads. They're either blockheads or they're the kind of person who could be tempted to follow a blockhead. They're they're either that way themselves, they are either trouble themselves, or they're the kind of person that could cause trouble for someone who's coming along who's not wary, who's not on his guard. Because this son, a good and faithful son, is being told, watch out for this guy. If sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Don't, Don't pay attention. What's he saying? He's saying that you are susceptible to this kind of appeal. You are susceptible to this kind of pitch. I'll put, an, uh, say, put another layer on it. There is no place in this fallen world where you can go where taking a stand for righteousness does not take courage. It takes courage. It takes spine. It takes backbone. You can be in a classical Christian school with all Christian teachers and all Christian classmates, and everybody's a, everybody's a Christian around the corner, over the horizon, everybody's a Christian, and there will be some blockhead saying, you ought to do this and try that and do the other thing, and you, in order to stand against it, have to have a spine. You, ha- you have to say no. And it's going to take courage to say no. It's going to, you, basically, this is the way the world is. 
This does not say that the pressure, that those people who are exerting the pressure are reprobates or they're not going to heaven or they don't know the Lord. It's just saying that the world is a complicated, messy place and we have to approach it in all wisdom. And wisdom is not, it's not simple. The great Puritan Thomas Watson said, Christ bled, but we must sweat. Christ bled, but we must sweat. And that's not saying that we earn our salvation or that we pedal harder. Or we, you know, salvation is a free gift. God gives us forgiveness freely. But when he gives us that forgiveness and we want to, and we're holding this forgiveness in our hands, we're holding this grace of God in our hands, and we say, what does this mean for me now in my life? What does this mean? How do, what does it mean to grow up in a, in a, into a, uh, the kind of person that understands the nature of this grace? And suppose I really understood it and suppose I really internalized it. How would that affect my behavior? Well, one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to have to sweat. You're going to have to do some hard things. You are not, you, you, going to heaven is not a function of rolling downhill. It's a, it's a function of climbing. It's a, it, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work in you to will and to, to do for his good pleasure. You, by grace you've been saved, through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, lest any man should boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works and sweat doing them. And you need to be wise, all right? Now, I, ha I have to say that there are a lot of young people in our circles who are dense. They're not wise. They are dense. They listen to fools. They hear fools. They are entertained by fools. That's what the modern entertainment uh, system has done for us. It allows us to be entertained in our homes by people that we wouldn't have in our homes. You wouldn't ever invite them to dinner. <laughs> With that mouth, are you kidding? But we will make them twice as big as that on a flat screen and yuck it up. That's all fine. Not if you, not if you have proverbial wisdom. Not if you understand that this is what God wants to work in us. This is what, this is what we're supposed to walk in. Not because we're trying to earn his gift, earn, earn his gracious gift, but rather because we've received it. And having received it, we want to grow in wisdom. We want to grow in that gracious wisdom. In the eighth chapter of Proverbs, wisdom is described in terms that go well beyond the attributes of a creature. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. Proverbs 8, 22 through 23. For various reasons, there are many arguments that go into this, which I won't go into this time for time reasons, but for various reasons, it seems wise to see this as a glorious metaphor, albeit a feminine one, for the Son of God. How does this wisdom speak? The Son of God, the word, the, the word proceeds from God. It was by the Word of God that God created the heavens and the earth, as we're told in countless places. And here we're told that God created the world by wisdom. It was wisdom that caused him to make the world the way he did. That's why wisdom is, is baked into the cake. Wisdom is, um, wisdom is just part of the way things are. Not to pick on the Greeks, but they just had an election where they, uh, they voted out austerity. Right? They, they voted out austerity. They say, we're done with austerity. We've, we, we, well, austerity is not a candidate that you can vote out. They voted out austerity, but you know what? Between you and me and anybody who knows math, austerity doesn't care. <laughs> austerity isn't moving. Austerity isn't going anywhere. Because if you say, I'm going to vote for a world in which we can all live on the big rock candy mountain and the cigarettes grow on trees and, and, and we, we have all this, uh, uh, all the, all the, you know, we live in God's welfare state. I'm going to vote for living in a place like that. I'm going to vote for a place where the mountain brooks run with wine. And I, I'm going to vote for a place that, where I can just reach out and suit myself whenever I want. Well, vote that way all you want. You can't vote in a world in which water runs uphill. You can't vote in a world that is other than the one God put you in. God put you in a world. He made you as his creature. And as his creature, you bear his image. Because our first parents sinned, we were plunged into folly and rebellion, which made us think that we could redo the world, that made us think that we can recast the world, that makes, makes us think that somehow we can come up with a world where two plus two equals five. 
if we want, but we cannot. God made the world by the word of God. God made the world by the wisdom of God. And consequently, wisdom is not optional. Wisdom is not optional. You cannot, I, once, I saw a great t-shirt once that goes along this line. There's a lot of wisdom, proverbial wisdom, to be found on t-shirts. This one said, gravity, it's not just a good idea. It's the law. Gravity is not just a good idea. It's the law. Now, you can, you can vote against gravity. You can say, I can fly. You can go jump off a cliff. And you can f- have the sensations of flying for a time. You can always arrange to kid yourself for a time that my abrogation of the, of the wisdom that God's built into the world have all gone away. All right? I've disobeyed the word of God at this point, and the, th- the things that God promised as a consequence... Those things didn't happen to me 15 seconds later. Therefore, I deny that they're going to happen at all. No. Think proverbially. Think with biblical wisdom. Think in biblical categories. So how does this wisdom speak? The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Wisdom hates Wisdom hates evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate pride and arrogance and the evil way and the mouth that pops off. Then in Proverbs 8, 36, but he that sinneth against me, (coughs) this is wisdom speaking, but he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All that hate me love death. When wisdom speaks and says, if you hate me, you love death. The, w- the world that God has created is a world teeming with life. That's another way of saying it's a world teeming with wisdom. And if you reject wisdom, you find yourself in a clutch embrace with folly, sin, and fruitless death. What is abortion? Abortion is people loving death. To the tune of a million and a half children a year. We love death. Why do we love death? Because we hate wisdom. Why are we turning state after state after state, and the federal government is about to impose it on, thinking about imposing it on all all the states. Why are we going for these same-sex mirages, these fruitless unions? Wisdom says, those who hate me, if you hate wisdom, you love death. All of this is, a, is God is striking us with a judicial stupor. God is striking us so that we hurry to our own destruction. We rush to our own destruction. Notice he, say, he, do, the, he doesn't say all that hate me. Wisdom doesn't say if you hate me, you will wind up dead sooner or later and death will catch up from, you, from behind. No, hatred of wisdom is the embrace of death. It, it is a love affair with death. It's seeking death out. It's wanting death. It's a death wish. You either turn to Christ, who is who is the one who is offers life and life abundantly. I came that they might have life, he says in the Gospel of John, and abundant life. I came to give you life. I came to offer you life. The book of the Bible begins with our our banishment from the tree of life. We are banished from the tree of life. Our first parents uh, used to eat from that tree until they took from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were banished from the tree of life. And then the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, sets before us again the tree of life again. And the leaves on that tree are for the healing of the nations. God begins his revelation to us with the tree of life. It ends with the promise of the tree of life. God is life, and God wants us to participate in his life. But there's no way to participate in his life without becoming wise. Because he is wisdom. He is wisdom. You can't say, I'd like the life part. I'd like the new life. I'd like the forgiveness part. But I I want to remain a blockhead. I want to remain an idiot. I want to remain. And one other thing. I should say this. I should have said it earlier. Um, in the Bible, folly is not an IQ thing. Right? Folly is not an IQ thing. There are people who are blockheads. There are people who are fools in the biblical way of speaking. You have high intellectual RPM. They've, uh, RPM. They've got a very high IQ. And, and you can be a blockhead and know Latin. There was a time 
before the failure of educational standards in our nation when all the leading blockheads knew Latin. Right? You, you can know a bunch of stuff. You can have a bunch of facts memorized and still be foolish. But you can't love God and be foolish. Because when you love God by his grace, when you love God, it's because he loved you first. And when he loves you first, you have, when he has reached out to you in his love, you have received his commitment to change you into a different kind of person, someone who's not so foolish. All of it, see, uh, the Christian life is not a matter of rule keeping, uh, ledger keeping. The Christian life is a matter of becoming like someone else. It's, it's growing up into the perfect man. And you can't grow up into the perfect man and not become like him. And he is wisdom. So if you've been called to be a Christian, you've been called to walk away from death, you've been called to repent of, repudiate, and have nothing to do with those who love death. Wisdom says, all that hate me love death. And this accounts for a good portion of what's going on in popular culture. This accounts for what's going on in a good portion of what we call entertainment. All who hate me love death. Why are people attracted to sick and twisted things? Because they hate wisdom. That's why. If they loved Jesus, they wouldn't be seeking that stuff out. If they loved Jesus, they would, they would be repulsed by that. If they loved Jesus, they would, they would turn away from that. Christ is expressly identified in the New Testament as the wisdom of God. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ is our Savior. This is Jesus of Nazareth, crucified, buried, and risen. And this is why, taking everything together, gathering it all up, we see that it is either Christ or death, Christ or or nothing, Christ or the outer darkness, Christ or evil, Christ or chaos. Those are the only, there are only two ways. There are only two tables. There are only two alternatives. It's Christ or nothing, Christ or chaos, Christ or evil. It's wisdom or not wisdom. It's wisdom or the rejection of wisdom. It's wisdom or death, wisdom or death. And what the preaching of the gospel does is set plainly, as Paul says in Galatians, before your eyes, Christ Jesus was plainly portrayed as crucified. When, when, the, when the crucified Lord, when Jesus Christ on a cross is set before people, what they are being asked to do is choose. Preachers of the gospel are pressing for a decision. What will it be, Christ or death? What will it be, life or death? What will it be, wisdom or folly? What will it be, this woman or that woman? What will it be? How are you going to spend your life? Are you going to throw it all away, or are you going to invest it? Are you going to give your life to Lady Wisdom, or are you going to throw your life away so that Dame Folly can do whatever she wants to with it? Well, she, and whatever she does with it, it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be good. And you can probably win arguments for the time being with people who are trying to warn you. Right? You might say, well, don't give me that. I don't, you don't have a verse. You, you, Anybody who sees, sees. This is why Jesus used to say things like, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Only two ways. It's Jesus or nothing. It's, it, Jesus is everything. It's Jesus or nothing. It's Jesus crucified, buried, raised, ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he pours out his Holy Spirit on you so that you can be wise. He's not doing it for any other reason. He is not uh, he did not die. He did not suffer. He did not allow himself to be buried. He didn't come back from the dead so you could stay just the way you are. He's got bigger purposes in mind. He wants to transform you. He wants you to become like him. You want, he wants you to be transformed from your current situation into his glorious image. That's what this is all about. This is a remodel project. The Christian faith is a remodel project. And every person who's baptized and attending to the, the means of grace and, and is praying and is reading the Bible and coming to worship and partaking of the Lord's Supper, all of these means of grace that God offers us, we're doing it because we say, by the grace of God, I trust that I will be utterly unlike the way I am today at some future day. 
And I hope that God will hasten that day. I hope God will accelerate it. I hope that God will work me over. I, I hope that God will do what it takes to change me into the kind of young man or young woman, to change me into the kind of mother or father, to change me into the kind of father, uh, grandfather, or grandmother, to change me into the kind of person he wants me to be. And all of that has to be consistent with wisdom, wisdom biblically defined. Our Father, we ask that as we depart from this place, that we would follow the path that you've set before us and that we would walk it out with the garland of wisdom around our necks. Help us to never hide our commitment to you and to your word. And as we ask for this, we offer up the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, what God sets before us in Proverbs is the antithesis. At the very beginning in Genesis, God set enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. That is the antithesis, the antithesis between light and darkness, the antithesis, an antithesis between faith and unbelief, between wisdom and folly. And one of the things that folly does is it tries to set up an alternative antithesis. It tries to set up either nationalism or tribalism, or in our day, uh, uh, with gender issues on feminism, it's gotten to the point where if you say there is such a thing as a foolish woman, everybody says, you just said that women are fools. No, I said that foolish women are fools, foolish men are fools. The antithesis is between faith and unbelief, not between women and men. All right, that's, that's, not the, that's not the antithesis. The antithesis is do you follow God or not? So, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.